and we're live. <laughs> Hello and welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, today we will talk about how to supercharge your sales strategy and seven ways to build a winning sales culture. So we'll just give a few minutes for everyone to join. Um, and also I have two guests with me today and I have Eric with me in the chat. And uh, just to get everyone started, can you tell me where you're joining from? And also, what's your role? Are you sales manager, CEO, uh, sales rep? It would be nice to know. So just leave a comment in the chat and we'll start uh, in a few minutes. Some is from Stockholm, Gothenburg, Sweden. Holstad, Denmark. Yes. South Africa. Very nice. Croatia. Okay. So we have some from the Nordic. Oh, yes. Denmark. So the Nordics and Northern Europe. Great. Okay. So welcome, everyone. Um, nice to see that we have uh, different representation all over Europe and South Africa. Um, so in this webinar, we will, uh, or you will learn how to use sales strategy and uh, CRM to create a winning sales culture, how to cultivate it over time and how to improve your team's performance. And by the end, you will leave with some actionable tips to implement in your CRM system and also achieve better results for your business. Uh, my name is Jeanette. I work with uh, Superoffice and the product uh, marketing team. And also we're joined by two guests, Camilla Heidnerash Bumann from Superoffice Norway and Sindra Horland uh, from SalesScreen. And uh, Camilla, she is the country or commercial country director of Superoffice Norway. Uh, and one of her favorite mottos is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And her passion is to build high performance teams with a winning culture, shared goals, and a lot of laughter. Um, and I've had the pleasure of having Camilla as my nurse leader for many years. So I can vouch for her passion and her focus on employee growth. Uh, so Cindy Horla, founder and CEO of SalesScreen. Uh, Cindy believes every company's success is a result of a combined talent and that even the leading products and services fall short if the people behind them can't perform the very best. And his favorite icebreaker uh, for new employees, it's hugs, <laughs> group hugs. And we will ask <laughs> why that is uh, in just a minute. And for those of you who don't know SuperOffice, um, it's a CRM platform for European uh, B2Bs based on 30 or over 30 years of experience. And it's the CRM suite that combines all of your customer facing processes, sales, marketing, and customer service. Uh, into one tech stack. So it's help, uh, it helps you build strong and loyal customer relationships. And SalesScreen is uh, a global sales platform that combines gamification with uh, data visualizations to keep sales team motivated, rewarded, and engaged. And the platform also integrates with existing CRM like SuperOffice, uh, and it makes, more, uh, makes work more collaborative through a range of peer-to-peer -peer recognition and competitions. just switching some slides here. And today we will talk about what's a good sales culture and why it's so important. And we'll touch on how to build a winning sales culture and also what steps you need to take. And we'll also give you seven practical tips on how you can use your CRM system. And we will be approximately or use approximately 60 minutes and we will have a Q and A at the end if you have any questions. Uh, also, we have uh, my colleague Eric in the chat that will help uh, and moderate, uh, and he will also mark and highlight some questions that we will save um, till the end. So, um, Sindra and Camila, welcome to the webinar. I'm very excited to have you. Thank you. Excited Great to be here. To be here. Great. And um, I wanted to ask, um, because you both have interesting backgrounds, both in terms of your company and how you started there. Uh, and also your experiences as leaders. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Camille, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences with um, 
having you know, a good good culture in a company? Um, yeah, I, my uh, my first job was um, uh, with uh, a telecom uh, vendor, um, and we were ten uh, people fresh out of school that had been hired and uh, went through a training program and. Uh, it was uh, an experience that really, I mean, we were just uh, soaking up the culture for many months before we started selling. I was a sales, uh, sales rep. And that was my first job. I stayed there for two, three years. And ever since I was looking for that same feeling, and I got it when I started in Super Office. And I was wondering what's the, what's the uh, common denominator here? And it was, it was the culture. It was the fact that uh, everyone was passionate about what we're doing. It was more than just a job. It was a company with values that we could identify with. And so uh, after having had different jobs for 15, 18 years, I sort of came back to a company with a strong culture and I felt myself what, uh, what it meant. So uh, I have personal experience with working in, in uh, companies with and without strong culture. Sure. Yeah, having a bad culture might be even worse than a, yeah. not having one at all. Yeah. Yeah. And Sindre, you have an interesting story with your with starting sales screen. You want to share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, sales culture is something that's very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, it's a bit of a foundational element to everything that we do. Uh, and I guess, you know, for me, it was also one part of the reason that I started the company initially. Um, so I founded the company, um, not with a, a brilliant idea. I didn't even uh, think about anything close to sales screen at the time. Uh, I just wanted to create an environment where we could kind of thrive together and, and be really like a good group of people that have fun at work. Uh, and I, th I think that assumption ultimately led through different uh, coincidence um, to the creation of sales screen, where everything is about making fun more work so that you can perform better. Uh, but that element of like getting to, together as a team and, and kind of like drive towards common goals and like the goal, uh, like you have a question up here. And I think uh, the goal, at least for, for me, when we're talking about the good sales culture, um, it's really about like creating that winning environment where people are self-determined to kind of put in the, the work that is required to go the extra mile and do that consistently over time. Uh, and that is not something that is done in a day. And it's something that it's ultimately is going to define your culture and kind of how you are as a leader and how you are as a company. Um, so it's it's super important. I think it's more important than ever, especially given uh, economic downturns. Uh, and we have a, a new one now uh, at the steps. So uh, I think uh, we, we will definitely see uh, what organizations and people are built of, uh, because it's uh, when things kind of like go against you a bit, that's really when you'll see the true um, you know nature of people and, and the company and the culture. And if they're able to kind of put in that uh, twice the amount of work to really get the same output that they did before. So love this topic, uh, very happy to be here. Great, very interesting. So like to sum up like a company culture, good or bad, uh, is an all inclusive element that you develop uh, and you grow and maintain over time. Uh, but you have to have certain standards and practices in place. Um, and it's kind of the sum of the attitudes and the values uh, and the habits that characterize your team. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask, what is a good sales culture to you? And like, why is this so important? Camila? Oh, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, first of all, uh, if you uh, if you as a company compete on price, you know how vulnerable you are because the minute someone uh, reduces their price, you're, you're sort of gone. It's the same with, with culture. If you compete on salary for people, anyone can offer your people a higher salary and you lose them. But if you have a strong culture, a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of purpose, uh, then it's much easier to keep your, your uh, employees and, and your winners. Um, so it's definitely important from, from that standpoint, but as, as, as you said, a culture is to sort of, uh, unmystify it. It's, it's a, it's a shared gut instinct. 
is the shared perception of what, what's the right thing to do. How should we treat customers? How should we treat each other? And the, the, big, the big thing about culture is that it starts with the smallest things. It starts with routines, right? It starts with everyone knowing what to do and being measured on it. So culture is not something that just happens. Um, you as a leader have to have a very um, clear idea of what, what you need to do in order to succeed. Uh, and so it starts with routines and you measure them. And over time, routines, when they're repeated, they become behavior. And behavior done over time uh, becomes an attitude. And an attitude shared by people is a culture. So it's, it's important to start with the mundane stuff with, okay, so what is good customer service? How, do, how should we treat each other and all the small stuff? And that's why also, I, that's why I think operational leadership is so important because if all you want is up here, then how, how, should, how are you gonna get your people on board to understand what makes up a good culture? Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, um, like, where do you have, a, like, do you need, what's a differentiator between like a good and a great sales team, you think, uh, Sindra? Hmm. That's a good question. I think uh, I wanted to, to to build a bit on uh, what was said here because I, I couldn't agree more. You know, ultimately you need to have a foundation in place. You need to have processes. You need to have, uh, you know, uh, ability to to train new people with the skills that's required to do the job and and feel mastery. Um, and I think that the next element is is really to have autonomy to to go out there and execute and feel that you can really do that. Uh, but the third element, and I think this is extremely important when we're talking about culture, is connectedness or, or a sense of purpose. And if you have all those three elements, that's what we, it's actually the foundation behind self-determination theory. And that's when people become intrinsically motivated to push the extra mile. Um, and the opposite effect, of course, is, um, you know, the extrinsic motivation where you have people who, who meet to work uh, and they're going to do the minimum that's required of them to kind of get their paycheck and leave because they're motivated through the money or the extrinsic factors. So like, how do you get people to really feel that uh, self or be self-determined and really push that extra mile? And I think that is those two, three elements is really important. If you have those present in the organization, you will see a team that's not only able to, to put in that, the mundane and, and like the repetitive task that's required to be consistent at their work, uh, but they're going to be so excited about it and engaged and like motivated that that's going to come through the camera. That's going to come through the phone. Like everyone can notice if they're talking to a person who hates their life or they're actually passionate about what they're doing. If you can create that, that's going to have a, an extreme impact on the result of the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, the, and when that happens with enough people, that's when it starts sort of feeding itself, you know? That's when, when you start having culture as a competitive advantage. And, and uh, to back to your question, I mean, the difference between uh, hitting your targets, not hit, hitting your targets, is good processes and good culture. Yeah. Because yeah. We, we all have to sort of, uh, uh, in Norwegian, we say blue for drakta. You sort of have to, you have to fight for the team and you have to take one on the chin and you have to bend over backwards in order to to make the, the um, to hit your numbers. And if people should do that, uh, for people to do that over time, they have to feel that uh, it's worth it. It's, th this is good for me, good for the company. This is, uh, we're working towards a common goal here. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think is the most important element in starting that, creating that good culture? On, on one side, it's the, the routine stuff, uh, but uh, the routines and the uh, behavior attitude that becomes culture. But um, I, I, I mean, you mentioned Peter Dricke in your uh, in your opening, um, and I'm a big fan of his. He was like uh, a man, the first management consultant or management thinker, maybe. Um, and he said things 50, 60 years ago. That's so valid today. Um, and he did an empiric uh, testing of what creates high performers over time. High performers being consultants, salespeople, hitting their targets. 
And he found that across industries, across size of companies, maybe even across uh, countries, I would think, there are five things that we all need in order to be high performers. First of all, we need to know what's expected of us. So what's my mandate? What's my purpose here in this company? What should I do? What do you expect of me? Um, and then you need to be given the opportunity to, to succeed, meaning the training, the tools, everything. Uh, you need to be given feedback underway to adjust your course. Uh, you need to get help if and when you need it. And finally, you need to feel that you're being evaluated fairly. If those five, and, and just think about those five things for yourself, because to me at least they resonate. If I feel that I have those five things in a company, I will be loyal, I will be on board, uh, because that's sort of the manifestation of my individual goals being the same as the company's. I feel that I go in the right direction. So to have a system where we're able to put those five things at the center and delivering it to your employees, that's a big part of creating a good sales culture. And that's maybe where I would start. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I like that one, actually. It is um, uh, obviously it's, it, they put a lot of effort into that model and, and it resonated for many business leaders over decades now. So uh, mm. it makes sense. Uh, it's undisputable, I guess. Uh, we usually have a, a bit different take on it, um, but it's it's aligned in the same elements. But we like to kind of see say that if, if you're going to create like a winning sales atmosphere or a, a great sales culture, you kind of like you need to have four key uh, pillars. Uh, so you need to be able to identify, as we've already spoken about, like how are we doing? What should I do? You know, uh, our goals, where do I need to improve? How do I need to be better? Um, you also need to fire up the competitive spirit of salespeople. Uh, we are competitive by nature. Uh, we like to, to push ourselves. We like to push the team. We like to push the organization to new heights. Uh, so to spark that competitive spirit, uh, while you kind of like motivate them and help them uh, to understand their purpose and, and why their work matters, not only for themselves and the company, but like motivate them also through incentives from time to time when they have to do a um, task that doesn't necessarily align with their own personal objectives and goals, because we're going to have those as well. Right. So it's something about that motivation and, and using different types of motivation, depending on what outcome that we're trying to drive. But ultimately, it's all about coaching as well, like being there for the employees as a manager, as leaders and seeing what they're doing, identifying what they're doing and help them improve those skills and kind of drive um, I would say development in the team because uh, nothing kills um, a good sales culture more uh, than a team that's stuck. So you, you kind of mm. need to feel that you're developing either like as individuals or as the company. So you kind of see like the, that you're on a trajectory to something uh, larger um, than where you were yesterday. So that's sense of self progress. I think that's important as well. Just, just to add to that, because I, I completely agree. And it's also about, I mean, one thing is knowing where we're going, but for people to know why we're doing the things we're doing. Because at least for me, if someone asks me to do something, I want to know why. What, why is this important? What, why should I do this? And I think that's, um, that's sometimes forgotten when it comes to, to sort of getting people to go along. You, you have to explain the why because then people will understand and take ownership. But if they don't understand why, it will always, it will never be a complete ownership. So, so that's, uh, that's an important uh, task for a manager, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, I actually love there, there's a comment here uh, from Guy. Um, I think he, he was the, the one from South Africa. Uh, and key rituals with the team uh, is important in a sales culture. It's like, that level of consistency, and again, I would say this kind of plays into the the, per, uh, the connectedness part of having uh, people who self determine and intrinsically motivated. Um, and it's like, you know, meeting on a Monday and uh, getting your goals out there. What are you going to drive towards this week? And like motivating each other and kind of creating that energy up. I think that's it's always uh, an important element mm -hmm. in creating a good sales culture. So. 
yeah, there's a lot to this. Uh, I, I think in explaining the why, that is super important uh, and we can't emphasize that enough, but ultimately, and since I'm here with super office and, and you guys you know, are CRM, there's gonna be some tasks that's just very hard to uh, explain to a rep why they need to do. Like update your forecast regularly. Well, why can't I wait to, just wait to, to Friday? No, do it straight away. Or like, you know, clean up your contacts on the account. Like those types of, of uh, tasks are not always like aligning with my goals as a sales rep to close that next, next uh, deal. That's every only thing that I'm thinking about. But you need to no, do that it's... for the organization. Like the why yeah, exactly. There. Because it's, it's important. It's easy to explain why it's important to the organization. Yeah. I mean, to but... bad news early is good news, right? So to be able to see, to see changes uh, when they happen instead of uh, a week later and, and so forth. So, and, and also I think um, to get people uh, to, to use uh, everyone's brains to the fullest uh, capacity when it comes to how we should get to uh, or achieve our goals. So every year we start with, uh, I mean, we have, uh, we have, um, uh, Concern. I suddenly forgot the, the English word for uh, the, the group management. Um, they have some goals for us. The board might have some goal, goals for us that we go into the new year with. And then I sort of, uh, or the, the management group in Norway, explain a little, uh, we write a little bit about them. And then we send them to all employees and we say, we're going to have a group exercise. It might take a whole day. Uh, please read through this and brainstorm and come up with ideas on how you, someone in the company, can help us get to these goals. And then we get all the ideas from the people. We do brown paper and lots of notes and uh, the, the poor guy documenting everything is creating sort of uh, lists or, or a treasure bank of ideas that we can draw from throughout the year, which is very powerful. And, and also the ownership is, uh, is uh, part of this. So. Um, so I think it's uh, it's uh, important to uh, also ask them about the how because we know we're going to go there. We'll tell you why. How how will we get there? Let's get your input as well. So everything is not just sort of uh, delivered or uh, forced. Absolutely. If you're able to do that, uh, and I think this is very common in the OKR framework of um, setting a goal. You kind of like have some organizational top level goals and and you try to engage uh, with the individual contributors to kind of build the team goals bottom up but as long as they're aligned with the organization's goal um mm. so i think that builds autonomy uh for each individual which is, again is one of the three key items you need to kind of feel self-determined and be intrinsically yeah. motivated so it's it's uh, super important but it's not always easy especially when you you kind of grow and scale um to kind of include mm. everyone so uh, we're probably better than most in norway of doing these kind of things um you know having a large chunk of my team in the us and working more with american companies and american leaders like uh it's not necessarily the norm there uh so it might be different from region to region but uh it's it's absolutely something that helps so. very good comments uh, here as well Guy is on fire here. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> no, but um, it, it says here personal discipline as well, because we, we talk a lot about uh, getting people on board and, and sort of creating enthusiasm, which is super important. But at the end of the day, there are some demands. Uh, I mean, when it starts with the routines there at the bottom, uh, everyone have to follow them. Uh, I mean, you, you can't have, you can't have, uh, well, Usually, there, there. I mean, the there's a um, an expression called you know salespeople that don't follow the rules, but they manage to sort of outperform everyone. They're called eagles, right, or something different uh, words for them. Those are usually the ones where you can you sort of see between the fingers when it comes to following uh, following all the routines. But uh, the ninety percent, they have to do it. Um, so it's, it's not uh, sort of uh, help yourselves. This is culture. It's not. It's not. Um, uh, it's not uh, letting people decide for themselves. It's about getting them to understand why we do things a certain way and to sort of 
want to to uh, want to do it that way because they see it works, which is yeah, where I, the sales processes comes in, right? Yeah, I would say like um, if you're able to align individuals' goals uh, with what you just said, the organization wants to do, but at the same time they feel autonomous in their process to get to those goals. Uh, <laughs> that's a great sales culture. If like, hmm. uh, just by, I would, I don't know, like if the individual's path towards the goals is the same as the organization and, and they kind of get to that realization themselves, like that's amazing sales culture. Uh, hmm. then we're talking a team that really is going to perform well. Sure. It's great insights. So we have to move on a little bit. This is very interesting. And then we'll talk more into the kind of the details and kind of the practical uh, side of things as well. How do you start? But I wanted to ask uh, the audience as well uh, what they think uh, is the key um, to building a top sales culture. And we actually asked this um, question on LinkedIn as well. And I will show this results uh, a little bit later. So I will just um, set up a poll right now and ask the audience to vote for the ones that, um, or the alternatives that I think is uh, the correct one for them. What's the key to building a top sales culture? Is it recognition of achievements, hiring the right people, company values or defined goals, and quality training and feedback? And there's a lot more options here as well we could add, but this is like the top four that we added in the LinkedIn poll. So I'm in, very excited to see what you choose. So people are actually answering now. Could you uh, kind of jump in here? What's your take on this and these options, Camila? Oh, uh, between those four, um, I can't have all of them. <laughs> no, but, uh, but obviously it's um, um, to me it's sort of uh, sort of split in two. Obviously, you, you have to get the right people and, and the right people with the right attitudes can also then be trained. So it doesn't have to be that they tick everything. But um, the most I, I can say something about what the, what's the most difficult things when it comes to difficult thing when it comes to hiring, especially salespeople. We, we often have a case and we have a thorough uh, hiring process, but what we can't test there is sort of the capacity, the proactiveness, the, the, the I, I call it the engine. Uh, how big is the engine? Uh, how fast is the acceleration? Um, to what extent does uh, the, the salesperson take responsibility for their own success? That's extremely difficult to, to figure out in a, in the sales uh, hiring process. So if you if you crack that nut the syndrome up for uh, for some advice from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, my first impression was uh, was the same uh, like can we have the, all of the above? Um, because it's like yeah, the question is what was the key to building a top sales culture? I think you need a little bit of everything. Um, honestly, <laughs> but what is like the most important thing here? Well, I guess you could say in a way that it starts with the type of people that you attract and hire, right? So it's like um, hiring the right people is kind of like cheating, in my opinion, um, if you're if you're creating a top sales culture. But it's, it's like a prerequisite. So you need to have the right uh, type of people who's open to coaching and wants to kind of like move the needle of the organization. Um, so it kind of starts there. But then again, if you have unrealistic goals that you're never going to meet um, and it's not clear what the expectations is of you as an individual, like, <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, it's mm -hmm. hard to, to do anything. Um, so uh, that comes back into the quality training and feedback. You, if you don't have the skills or you feel mastery of the work that you're doing, and you don't get feedback on, are you on the right track? How can I improve? How can I become better? You know, that again, uh, it kind of falls true. So, uh, the last one that I haven't talked about is probably the closest one to, to a lot of the things that we do in sales screen as well. So. I'm not going to dive too much into that, but I think if I have to pick one, I think I, I have to start with hiring the right people because that's where it starts. And as I said, you kind of build elements on top of that. Uh, but yeah, it's a tough one. Another way of, of answering this question is that if you lack any of these four, you'll probably not succeed. That is very true, actually. Yeah. So, so maybe it doesn't matter which is the most important because you need all of them. Yeah. That's true. Hmm. 
And the audience actually said a little bit differently. They chose uh, company values and defined goal as the first one. But of course, it's a it's a tie. It's a very close tie in all four. Um, and the same goes with um, uh, the one we had on LinkedIn, which is the same question, same options. But they're ev kind of the majority uh, chose hiring the right people, as you were talking about. That that's kind of the first step. Like how do you find the the right people and the ones with the the yes hat and the and the engine, mm. right? Mm. So I think yeah, that's another way of framing it. Like you need all four. Yeah, so, you do. Yeah. <laughs> So let, let's talk a little bit more about like more practical side of things. Like, where do you start? Like, if you're an, a new uh, sales leader or you're in a new organization, you have, kind of have to turn around uh, something like kind of a, um, looking more like a bad culture. How do you start? Sindri? Yeah, I think you have a good list uh, still on the poll, right? So you kind of need to start with the goals. Like, where is it that we're headed? Um, so what is the company values and kind of like, what are we doing as a business and what are the goals that we want to succeed with? Um, and when, once that is clear, like, do you have what is required, you know, in the team to, to actually meet those uh, goals and expectations? If not, you need to hire the right people. <laughs> um, and, uh, if you have the people, but you need to turn it around, uh, what is uh, the struggles, right? Is it that you're just plain demotivated because they've lost track of the the purpose, the connectedness, the, they feel like they're a cog in a machine instead of actually, you know, being a vital part in, in defining the machine. They feel autonomous. Don't they have what is required to, to actually master the work? Do they have the tools to process? Is that in place? You know, um, I think, yeah, you, you do need to do several things, but you kind of define your strategy first. And once that is defined and you know the process, you know what is required of you. I think it all is going to come down to motivation. You know, you need to get people on board with what you're doing here. And I guess that is why most people have answered company values and defined goals as well, because uh, if they are on board uh, with the new plan, the new strategy, and they feel excited about what this can actually mean for them individually and the business that they're a part of, uh, they're going to step it up and you're going to see more work being done um, and they're going to be more happy, which is also going to come true through the screens or in customer facing meetings. And, and that's going to have the ultimate impact um, and to, to kind of succeed in turning it around into a winning sales culture. Yeah. And especially when, I mean, when you hire new people, the value of having well-defined processes and uh, sales methods, extremely important because otherwise it's like reinventing the wheel every time, trying to get all the information into the heads. I mean, we, we're, we're in the business of complex sales because uh, it's uh, software with a lot of opportunities. It's uh, changing the way companies do their most important uh, things, the sales, the service and the marketing. Um, so you have to be quite knowledgeable when it comes to business processes, uh, technical uh, consultancy, because you're selling a project as well. So uh, if when, when you've decided where you're going, to then sit down and create best practice processes that's, that's supported in the solution somewhere. So it's not just on paper, it's, it's actual work or, or work support. Um, that's, that's extremely important to, to get uh, new salespeople, new consultants, new everything up and running. Um, and and it, it comes down to how do we sell here? What, what's the first thing you do? Uh, what's the presentation for the first meeting? How do you uh, summarize? Uh, what do you send to the customer? What's the next activity? How do you book that? What uh, templates do you use? And obviously train them in all of this. Yeah. So, so that's when, that's when you start seeing what's behind the word culture, right? Because in order to have these self-performing uh, salespeople uh, living the brand, they have to have all this knowledge in their suitcase, uh, suitcases and, uh, and um, being up to speed on how we do things. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the, you, you have some sales fundamentals that needs to be there. And then that is something that I've definitely seen from, from being a first time founder and not having any idea what I was, was doing to hiring some pretty exceptional people who has been through this run several times. Like 
there's a drastic difference between um, having leadership which knows what you're talking about and defining that fundamental there, that basis of like, these are the skills that you need to master. This is what the process is going to look like. These are the steps that you're going to take to to go from a prospecting work to actually closing a deal. And if you kind of like understand uh, what's required of you and you have, uh, you know, goal setting theory, goals that are realistic to meet, let's not like um, overwhelm people and, and never get that sense of winning um, because we need that as human beings. Uh, but I think ultimately, you know, we need to tap into the currencies of, of uh, a sales team. Uh, and there are four of them. Uh, we most familiar with, uh, you know, money or things. Um, that is definitely one that is, is big, but uh, there are three others, like fun is one of them. Like we need to create this culture of engagement. You need to have fun at work. You need to have fun with what you're doing. If not, you're going to wear yourself down to the, to the state where you, you, you kind of feel a burnout and you, you leave or you quit and, and you, you can't be going on anymore. Uh, but two other currencies that we can also tap into is actually self-esteem and social capital. Uh, and I guess that's where recognition of achievements kind of comes into play, not only recognizing that biggest deal of the year, but like recognizing the tinier wins that happens along the way. Hey, you made a new all time record in cold calls this week. I know that's incredibly hard and you now pushed it uh, north of 50. Maybe you have someone in the organization who's hammering out over 100, but that's a personal win. And we need to recognize it. We need to celebrate it. We need to elevate it. Uh, and give them like, hey, a self-esteem boost and some social capital. This person is now leveling up and kind of like at that next stage. And it's going to very soon, uh, you know, propel towards their goals and, and get north of them. So oh, there's so much to talk about. I mean, um, you kind of, I hope you kind of feel it, but obviously this is super exciting uh, stuff. So, yeah. I agree. That's great. Yeah, and it's uh, like it's very important, like you said, Sinda, that you have to kind of celebrate the small wins and the achievements uh, mm -hmm. as well, and not just the, the top performers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because the fun thing and, and this this celebration it doesn't have to be sort of oh we have to do the big party we have to no it, it's it's more about the everyday it's it's how we talk to each other how how we how we're able to if you're able to laugh at yourself then you're able to laugh at and with others uh, and, and to sort of create the banter and the, the high ceilings and the, the the everyday fun with the cahoots and the ice creams and i mean the the, the small stuff uh, and with the as you say in the showing uh, the small wins the the good results um so that you're celebrating uh good performance and it becomes something that people want to to have and or, or to achieve. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm. That's a culture of engagement and that's ultimately going to drive a winning sales culture. So mm. I think it's uh, super important to realize that, especially as leaders, you know, it's it just get harder and harder as we kind of grow as, uh, the companies and we get more people to recognize the individuals. Uh, so obviously, you know, the sales managers is going to play a, a very important role here in identifying these wins and elevating them up so that we can talk about it on the next town hall or you know when mm. we're all together as personal wins that we want to celebrate as a part of the company culture like this mm. matters for us we see progress and we see individuals and how they do better uh, and that is going to create winning sales teams so absolutely yeah and you're kind of touching in on uh like my, my second question which is uh, kind of hiring superstars versus the like the process-based culture um because many s says that like starting start with hiring the right people uh but there's often a misconception that having superstars or high performers uh on the sales team will contribute to a winning culture like do you have any insights on that like do you think that's correct or is it uh, yeah, I can start. So, I mean, uh, superstars are always important. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the Pareto law, um, you know, an 80, 20 rule also applies for most sales teams. Uh, mm -hmm. it's the top 10 to 20% performers who's gonna, uh, you know, do most of the carrying in, in any sales team. And, and we work with several hundreds, if not thousands now, uh, and it's always the same. But when you look behind the numbers, it's the middle of the pack, you know, the 80, 80 percent in the middle, 60 to 80 percent. That is where the, the true uh, results are being created. Like if you can 
elevate the middle of the pack uh, just a tiny bit, that is going to move the needle for the organization. So you're not going to avoid having top performers. It's always going to be a part of any sales team. There's someone who just nailed it. Um, but it's really, I think, you know, winning sales culture and creating that next level of results for the business is all about, you know, the, the normal people the, in the middle of the pack, the ones who get at work and kind of like put in their work and, and, and they, they feel it. Um, and if you can move their feelings and, and they can be a bit more engaged or have a bit more fun or become a bit better, like that is ultimately going to drive much more of the result. Definitely. If those 10 hundred people uh, improve uh, 20%, it will have a bigger effect than if the one, if the superstar does it right. Yep. And, and also it's, uh, if it was, if it were possible to only hire superstars, I think we would all do it, but uh, they, they're scarce, right? They're difficult mm -hmm. to find. And by superstars, that's, that's the same as I mentioned earlier, the Eagles, right? It's, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's been said that uh, in a company, you usually have 10% uh, eagles. They're able to do what they want. You have uh, the 80% in the middle, and then you have 10% on the transfer list. That's maybe in America where it's a bit uh, bit more harsh, but that's usually the way it is in a, in a sales team. Um, so if you're then able to, to work with the 80%, then uh, I agree that's where um, the, the highest potential for improvement lies. It is, yeah. and, and it's hard to kind of like single out uh, those superstars as well. Like, how do you hire them? Because, um, you know, to Camilla's point, um, super office and sales screen is highly complex types of deals uh, where we need to, to know a lot of things to succeed. Uh, that might not be the case if you're working, let's say, from a contact center or a call center um, and, and you're selling insurance to private consumers. You know, there's a different set of skills that you is required to win at that game. Um, so there is like the right individuals in the right company makes a superstar. Um, so it's, it's like, does the superstar in super office uh, necessarily become a superstar in sales screen as well? I don't know. Um, that, that, that might not always be the case. So it's hard to kind of single out and, and identify and kind of like hire only superstars. So I think that's, that's like an, an impossible thing to do. Um, would be fun and, and to also, learn the recruiter's point of view here, though. <laughs> yeah. Another interesting uh, point is that, at least to me, the ones you think will become the superstars, not always do, and the ones that you did not imagine would become the superstars, they do. So it's, it, it's as Sindra said, it, it's a sort of combination of, of uh, what makes that person tick and how they're able to capitalize on their personal traits and their experience, and then somehow make a winning cocktail or, or a winning recipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you need to define the strategy, you know, to know what and how and why uh, you sell. You need to have the right people. Uh, you need to train those people and, and continuous feedback. Any other um, steps in that um, of building that good sales culture? Camila? Everything else we've been talking about today, <laughs> it's, it's a big area because it's, it's sort of, uh, it's leadership, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, process focus, it's, uh, it's, um, but one thing that's, um, that, I think, that I think is more important today uh, when it comes to being the superstar or, or, or succeeding is that Compared to a few years back, you need a new set of skills today to be a good salesperson. First of all, you need to have deep knowledge about the market your customer uh, is operating in. So you have to understand maybe the vertical, what's happening in the market, the mega trends, what kind of pressure are your potential customer under uh, in order to sort of come to them with a 70, 80% finished idea of how you can improve their, their lives. The customers are no longer willing to go through the, the solution selling method of 200 questions and uh, sort of let's take our time and meeting after meeting to, to get to your pain and find your possible value. So, so that's, that's a new skill set that uh, sales, all salespeople need. And especially those working on collecting new customers, they also need to be good at social selling or account-based selling. Uh, because at least in our world, the cold calling doesn't really work anymore. 
it's it's really difficult to to get uh, to get new customers. So you have to and and also trying to invite someone to be in your network on LinkedIn, and then uh, when they say yes, you you ask for a meeting. That's like asking for a marriage on the first date, right? So sort of that whole skill set is also needed for for salespeople. So it, it's a more complex job and 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 uh, job tasks than ever for a salesperson. So how do you uh, kind of navigate that micromanagement versus the, the process? Because if you have a, a well-defined sales process and it's the, it's documented, it's implemented, like is where does that sit in this building a winning sales culture? Because a lot of people say that freedom or independence is a, is a very key thing of having that um, winning team. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I mean, um, obviously, uh, we are a gamification platform, so I would say gamify it. Uh, and by that, I, I mean that you have some business objectives that you're running towards and you're breaking it into smaller goals and aligning it with the individuals. Um, and those smaller goals needs to be celebrated. It needs to matter. So we need to tap into self, um, esteem and social capital as two currencies that we can reward them with. Um, but once they kind of like start to collect these achievements or like they, they see progress towards these smaller goals that ultimately is going to drive towards the organizational goals. Uh, that's going to give a lot of like uh, a, a big boost to the team. But the fact that you have so many, uh, and I'm not talking hundreds, but you know, you know, 20, 30, maybe smaller goals, they can select between them what they want to, to work on next. And by that they feel autonomous, but all goals have been carefully curated and aligned with the organizational business objectives that you're driving towards. So that's one way to kind of like uh, retain uh, the feeling of autonomy and, and the individual's uh, ability to kind of select what's important for them, but make sure that they do it in an environment that kind of ultimately aligns with the, the company. And once they collect them or achieve them, celebrate it you know make a big fuss about it talk about it like recognize it from top down and from peer to peer like yeah then it matters more than cash but cash helps and, and the, if you want <laughs> cash always helps and then then obviously can't be you can't have freedom when it comes to oh uh, to me this case is in the negotiate phase mm -hmm it's very difficult as, as management to sort of evaluate the pipeline if we don't have a common True. agreement on, on what makes something go from one phase to the next and what makes the probability go up. So, so that's never, that's, that's non-negotiable, uh, that you have to follow sort of uh, the method. Um, and for that, you need verifiable outcomes that you definitely can say, has this moved from here to here? Yes, because we have sent or we have uh, sent the, the proposal, we have and so forth. So, so yes, freedom on, on how to, because you've been given the skill set to, to sort of uh, pick and choose uh, from, from uh, best practices, but, uh, but not freedom when it comes to doing your core, uh, the, the core elements. Uh, they have to be done, but you can choose how you get there. And if you're the kind of, of salesperson that somehow, very, very rare, but somehow you're able to skip three phases and get the customer to decide without going through all the, all the different uh, phases and verifiable outcomes, then, then fine if the customer is ready to decide. It, it's not micromanagement, but it's, it's a best practice for a reason, right? It's, it's the way we usually win. It is. Yeah. So I, I think that is extremely important to kind of like have freedom within set constraints. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of aligns with what uh, the consensus is in the chat as well. Like uh, Kathy pointed out originally, like leadership is super important and leadership is all about setting those constraints. And we do it not by chance or not by random, I hope. Like we do it because we have the data now. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have much more data today than we had 10 years ago, but we can actually curate insights from it. So we know based on everything that we're seeing in our systems, this is how it should be because that has the highest conversion rate to win and you want to win, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it kind of, you need to have the constraints and that is leadership in my opinion, 
and they should be based on insights that is generated by the team so it becomes like a self learning and improving machinery so yeah that's great so we have to move on because we're a little over time uh, in terms of our agenda uh, so I wanted to jump to the next uh, uh, slide, which is uh, to talk about the seven practical tips in terms of using your CRM system, uh, because that's kind of uh, our source of truth. That's what we wanted to promote. Of course, you can use Excel sheets, but we don't really promote that. <laughs> but the best thing yeah. is to put it in the system. Huh? No, no, we don't recommend that. No, don't recommend. <laughs> So um, this is just a few tips to get started um, to leverage your CRM system. Um, and the first is, of course, to use the CRM system to collaborate and share info. That has to be the, uh, the single source of truth um, to get that valuable 360 degree overview uh, so that it's easy to find information. And uh, that's make, that makes the customer experience great. And the users are also more productive. Um, and they can also trust the data. So that's a tip, uh, make routines, implement them, and then you can also reward users. And then you can use sales screens or other incentives right, to, to drive that CRM adoption. But it's important to kind of use that as a single source or single system of truth. And then you need to define the right activities. And I know this is, uh, Camilla, you're a very, you're a big fan of this one. And we talk about that a lot in SuperOffice. Um, but you need to have that, if it's a sales methodology or if it's solution, solution selling or whatever it is, you need to kind of track more than just meetings. You need to define the right activities. Uh, you need to, to measure uh, level, uh, level of activities and you need to have the quality of activities to so not just for the sake of registering an activity, but it needs to drive you to that ultimate goal. And then also you need to define the sales process as we'll be talking a lot about today, um, document it and implement it in the CRM system so that you have a guide or like a step-by-step -step best practice, what to do in different stages to ensure sales success. So this can be best practices, it can be um, a guide, but it's not mandatory steps like you were talking about, Camilla. It, it has to be uh, a little bit of freedom, but in some certain constraints. Another tip is to set sales targets in the system, set goals, um, because the ability to meet sales targets is a key factor that defines how well a team or individuals performing. So targets can be set for the organization, it can be set for the team or per sales rep. So you can measure revenue, um, number of deals closed. It can be cross sales, but also X number of cold calls made or demos or follow-ups. Also very important if, if uh, a sales rep doesn't meet its, uh, his or her target, then you can celebrate number of new processes started and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just to keep revenue. morale up. And also pipeline management, um, use your CRM system to, to update the pipeline and register the sales and opportunities because when the sales pipeline is full of leads and they're in different stages of the process, you need to make sure that you're managing uh, it effectively. So you need to update the pipeline regularly. Uh, you need to monitor the metrics and you need to review it and improve it. So having a defined process uh, or a sales guide, as we call it in SuperOffice, um, also gives you an up-to-date pipeline. And then like the, the other point is having the KPIs uh, and visualize them, use dashboards um, and track the performance. So you can, um, so don't manually update spreadsheets and send them via email and back and forth, put them in the CRM system and keep them up to date. And with dashboards, you can quickly analyze the information. You can determine how you can improve performance and follow through uh, with action. It's also a great way to use in one-to-one uh, -one meetings or team meetings. And it's obviously smart to use sales screen for, for visualizing all of the data in the, in the CRM system. Yeah. Yeah, because to get it out there, to, to share it, to create the fun and, uh, and uh, the focus. 
we have a big screen outside the, here on the so one thing is that you can you can have a look at it uh, in your own uh, CRM solution but it's important to have like uh, common sales screens and and show uh, show how it's going yeah yeah it's very important and that may, brings me to the final uh, tip also which is data uh, if you use the service system you put in the sales you update the sales uh, you have good data and it's also easy to uh, use that as a single source of truth. You can integrate that with other systems to um, to help sales reps. For example, you can see your ERP or financial numbers in the, the system. Uh, you can get created data or prospecting apps, uh, or you can export it to other tools like a business uh, analyze or um, sales screen. Uh, and we have an app store that makes it easy to extend the functionality um, with standard apps, uh, modules and integrations and sales screen is one of them. So that's, um, it's a great, um, great thing to have to, uh, to kind of push the, the competitions and having it more visualized. Plug and play, level up. I don't play. <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to ask you in the audience again, with another poll, uh, in terms of these points, like what will you focus on first to improve your sales culture? when you're using your CRM system. So uh, Eric will start the poll just to see um, what you guys think. What are your preferred? What's the, like the, the main thing for you to, to work on, Sindra? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, define the right activities, I think. Uh, you need to understand uh, what is important um, to win. And uh, that can be many different things. Uh, it doesn't have to be like mm -hmm. you have to do a set number of cold calls. It might have to do with, um, you know, um, completing the medic uh, review of an opportunity. So you have a lot, but you don't know the economic buyer or you don't know the business metric that you're going to influence in your deal. Um, so, you know, let's um, define that as an activity to have 100% medic completion in every opportunity and let's hunt for it. Um, so it's also, you know, yeah, I think maybe that is for me the starting point. Uh, and then there's a lot uh, to do once you have that in place. Yeah. So I see people are, uh, or the answers are coming in and everyone's kind of uh, leaning towards the defining the right activities. It starts there. It's very important. This is also like the last one. You need all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you define the right activities, they will turn into a process because activities in a sequence is a process. Um, when you have a process, you will also have the target, then you will know how to reach your targets and you will have the KPIs in the solution. Uh, doing that correctly, you will, as management, have pipeline management and also on the individual level, it's so important in order to drive your cases forward. So, so, and if you do all this, do you have enough data to collaborate and share? So all of this is, is sort of, um, intertwined and, yeah. and you need all of it, you need again, all of it to succeed. Mm, that's true. Yeah. So hopefully everyone goes home and start defining and uh, updating their service system. <laughs> but <laughs> but the... an interesting finding from, from meeting a lot of, of customers is that, uh, scary many do not, uh, do don't do pipeline management properly or do it manually in excel yeah which is madness because uh, everyone knows that the minute is not part of a crm uh, solution it's dead the minute you write it so uh, so um i mean that's where a lot of companies have uh, have uh, improvement uh, potential absolutely to understand yeah. and be able to be proactive Will we, we, will we manage the targets this month, this quarter? If not, what can we do now in order? What are, what are the, the actions? What do our salespeople need to know, do now in order to get um, to save next quarter's uh, budget? Yeah. yeah. Like Kathy says, like we say, it's, uh, if it isn't in the CRM, it didn't happen. <laughs> I love Kathy. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is the foundation for a lot of insights, right? So when you have good pipeline management, you will also start to understand your sales velocity, um, which I think is uh, really interesting uh, to look at over time. Um, so it's, it's um, of course, you can have everything in your CRM, but you also need to move it, move it out, move it 
onwards, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. and that is, I guess, pipeline management or good pipeline management. But once yeah. you start to do this, um, you know, regularly, you will start to, to, to care more about the velocity as well. How fast do we move through the pipeline? And yeah. what will that mean for the future, as you say, forecasting? So it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll also be able to develop your people because some people lose. Why do you always lose in the negotiate, in the negotiate phase? What can we do to, to help you get past that? Uh, because people have different strengths, so they can learn from each other. Which is then again back to number one there, collaborate and share info. Yes. Kathy has a question. Yeah, that's great because we were, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're behind that we have paid Kathy, Kathy today, but we haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is uh, just a final wrap up because we don't have a lot of time. So uh, Kathy, just uh, pop the question in the chat. Uh, we will continue because I know there were one before. Uh, also, there's been a, a great engagement in the chat. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Guy asked, may I ask, do you have any passengers uh, and or Mavericks in your teams? Can you ask Sindre? Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, just to, to be clear, what do Guy define as a Maverick um, and as a passenger? I'm guessing that's a, uh, let's go back to the chat. That's wow, this is cool. Mavericks are the people who initially know how to navigate a sales campaign. So it's okay. like eagles, right? This is the yeah. self going have on. have different names for everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess, I guess that is where at least, uh, what you're, you're getting at guy. Uh, and if that's the case, of course we do, uh, we, we have different types of personalities in the team. And, and I would say, you know, it's not necessarily like they are stuck in that um, forever. There are movements in the team as time goes by as well. And, and people might go from being a passenger to becoming a maverick uh, if you have a good sales culture. Really interesting question from, from Kathy at the end here. When you have employees who are not following protocol, why do you think they decide not to? And I think there are many answers to, uh, to that question. Uh, one, one is that uh, it could be painful because it will uh, make it clear that they're not doing enough, uh, that they're not uh, following the process, that uh, that they don't have enough cases in their pipeline, that they're not filling it up sufficiently. So it, it could be, it's, it's sort of easier not to, not to bother with it because uh, the results in there aren't good. It could also be uh, that they haven't understood the why. Why should I do this? Why is this important for me and for, for uh, management who see the aggre aggregated the numbers? Um, uh, and then uh, it could also be if, if you have a personal conflict between a manager, a sales manager and a sales rep, it could be that uh, I'm, I'm uh, sort of uh, being, uh, I'm sticking it to him or her uh, because I don't want him or her to succeed. So I'll, I won't help them. I won't show my cases. So I think there are several reasons. And uh, the thing is to to get to the bottom of why and to just start having having a talk and, and trying again to understand or to explain the why and ask why it's not being followed up on. Yeah, I, I think I would uh, agree with uh, not understanding the why. It's often a, a big thing there, uh, but it could also be that they have uh, different, uh, let's say, in personal uh, goals um, that have changed. Maybe there's something back home that is, is taking up all of their mental consciousness and they, they just don't feel motivated enough anymore to push um, and then do that work, even though they understand why they don't have, like, I understand why I need to go on the treadmill uh, and I should preferably do that two to three times a week, but I, I might not do it. <laughs> Am I motivated enough? Do I see the reward in the end? Is that reward? Um, like do have a different reward that is greater for me right now. So mm -hmm. it, it's a bit about motivation as well. Uh, sometimes uh, you know why, but you just don't see how it aligns with your your top goals as an individual anymore. Um, that uh, 
hopefully is something that can be worked on through some coaching sessions and one-on-one -on -one times with the manager. In Norwegian, you know, the word uh, bingo means uh, maybe not hitting the target, but I think uh, Kathy meant here that uh, she recognized the number one reason. Maybe because, I, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because in Norwegian is like completely hitting the mark. That's bingo. <laughs> the first thing you said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat and we really need to wrap it up because I know Sindra has a flight to catch yeah. as well. Oh, we spent um, Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to just summarize uh, a winning sales culture takes time, of course, and effort to build. But hopefully you got some tips today uh, to start building uh, yours. Um, but it can help also help you to, to grow a productive and loyal sales team. That's kind of the idea. Um, if you want to contact Camilla or Sindra, you can send them an email or reach out on LinkedIn if you want to continue the chat there. Uh, also, you can send uh, an email to info at superoffice.com. I will try to respond or forward that to the right person. And then also I would say, check out our blogs. Sales Screen has a lot of great content on their blog uh, on this topic as well. Uh, SuperOffice has uh, a lot on sales in particular. Um, so check that out. Uh, and also we will follow up with an email so you have all the contact details there. So I just want to say thank you all for joining. Thank you, Camilla and uh, Sindra, for sharing your experiences and uh, thoughts on the topic. Very interesting to hear. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. And um, I wish you all a super day. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.